taking faith into your own hands for yourself and the environment. That's often the key to success, especially during these difficult times. On today's edition of Eco Africa, we will introduce you to a lot of different people who are doing just that with various initiatives to help the environment. Welcome to the show. I'm Neil Taigwe coming to you from Lagos, and I'll be saying a big hello to my colleague Sandra in Kampala. Hello, Sandra. Thank you, Nyota, and a warm welcome from me, Sandra Twinovidio, here in Kampala, Uganda. You are absolutely right, Nyota. On that topic, we'll meet the Maasai in Kenya, divers in Egypt, and so much more. Here's what you can look forward to in the next half an hour. We show you the potential of big data to protect the environment. You also learn about how designers in Spain are recycling old material into cheap fashion and how sawdust and rice husks are used to grow delicious mushrooms in Ghana. But first, we have a look at Tunisia's northern desert, where the effects of climate change are increasingly noticeable. In the arid area around Karokan, the soil is dusty. It is getting harder for farmers to cultivate their land. Average rainfall throughout the year has gone down. Water has become a luxury. Fewer and fewer farmers here have a sufficient amount of this precious resource, as they are forced to use water more effectively. The people in this area are teaming up and getting creative. It takes a lot of water to irrigate his olive groves and vegetables. So Tunisian farmer Sharif Chehebi has three cisterns to collect rainwater. He owns 90 hectares of land, which is a lot for the Kairouan region. We can pump six litres per second onto the fields. In summer, the system runs for 16 to 17 hours a day. We use less water in the cooler winter months. There's still enough rain. And with our well, we always have enough water. Not everyone's situation is as comfortable. Just 10 kilometres away beyond these mountains, life is much harder. Most families here have to walk several kilometres to get to the nearest water source. To cover their daily needs, they might have to make a number of trips back and forth. Rijab Zagdud requires 250 litres of water every day, just for his animals and his fields. He needs an additional 40 litres for himself, his wife and their three children. It's really tough for the people who live in this region. It takes everyone so much time to fetch water. We're tired. Our children can't carry on doing this every day. It's a burden on the entire region. We still have no running water at home. It affects our quality of life. It's so hard. We're all trying to find solutions. Systems that collect rainwater could offer the people here some relief. And now hundreds are being built with the help of a German development agency. Until now, a large part of the rainwater here was going unused. The cisterns catch the rainwater that runs off the houses, which can be used as drinking water and for irrigation too. The farmers can use it to grow almonds, olives and rosemary, which don't require that much water. The agency also advises farmers and has set up what it calls water forums. Constructive strategies are developed there and farmers can discuss which plants they could grow that would use less water. We have a really unusual situation in the region we're in now. There's basically no groundwater left because too much of it has been used up over the years. So the farmers are now having to resort to stored water. But getting water to store is also a problem. It hasn't rained much in the past four years. 
farmers get their water from this embankment dam. It supplies more than half a million people in Tunisia. But as water levels decline, it's being pumped further and further across the country. And that has a direct impact on the people who live here. Pressure is mounting, even on the farmers who didn't think they had to worry about their water supply. In some places, water is actually being stolen. There are an estimated 20,000 illegal wells in Tunisia. That's why raising awareness of the problem is so important. If nothing changes, farmers and their animals will no longer be able to survive in these mountains. And then the region might soon become uninhabited. Using our resources wisely will be the great challenge for us in the coming decades. In fact, the world needs a change of direction in many areas, including textile production. And upcycling is a new buzzword. One clothing designer in the Spanish capital, Madrid, uses everything he can get his hands on, from old plastic bottles to tires to create items for his fashion label. His motivation is, there is no planet B. Old fishing nets are transformed into quilted jackets. Old plastic bottles become backpacks. Just two of the items made by the Echo Alf label. T-shirts, sneakers, and jackets. Almost everything in this Madrid shop is made from recycled materials. Echo Alf's founder is Javier Goyeneche. He got the idea for the label in 2009. The initial motivation was the frustration with the amount of waste we're creating in the world. I believe the most sustainable thing to do was not to keep on using natural resources. So recycling could be a solution if we were able to make like a new generation of recycled products with the same quality and design as the best on recycle. That way we could demonstrate there's no need to keep on digging deeper and deeper to get petrol, but we can transform what other people call waste into polymer yarn fabrics and products. These flip-flops are made of old car tires. They're 100% recycled and don't even need glue. The labels reveal what goes into these products. All these labels, we try always to put in, the, in, in our garments the labels. No? This one says that we need 235 grams of discarded fishing nets to make one yard of fabric. Goyeneche is hoping to raise awareness of environmental issues and at the same time create fashion that looks good. Spanish journalist Brenda Chavez reports on sustainability and observes the trend. It's starting to catch on, but it didn't really pick up speed until the annual figures for textile waste became more common knowledge. Now the industry is beginning to react to the problem that we're having with plastic. Echo Elf says it's recycled over 330 tons of waste taken from the sea. The label cooperates with Spanish fishermen. They gather the waste from the sea for the fashion house. Old fishing nets and plastic bottles are processed to make polymer yarn that goes into the fabrics used to make new clothes. The label wants to make an environmentally conscious lifestyle part of its image. Its slogan, because there is no planet B. It's part of a whole lifestyle. The whole zero waste movement is growing and people want to produce less waste and have less impact on the environment. A fashion trend or the future of clothing? Javier Goyeneche is continuing his experiments with upcycling and hopes his idea will catch on in more Mediterranean countries. Now, there are some very fantastic pieces in that report, and it's hard to believe that most of them are made from old plastics, some, some of them like this. But as we've already seen, plastic waste in the sea is especially harmful for all manner of marine life, including coral reefs. In Egypt, over 300 professional divers took advantage of the coronavirus lockdown to clean up the popular tourist resorts. The team spent about three days above and below the water. Here's this week's Doing Your Bit. I see more. Oh. 
Egypt's Red Sea coast is blessed with one of the world's most stunning coral reefs. It's a hot spot for divers and tourists. But plastic and other trash endanger this sensitive underwater ecosystem. To counteract this, Egypt's Chamber of Diving and Water Sports initiated underwater cleanups during the COVID-19 lockdown. Divers from Sharm el-Sheikh, Dahab and Hurghada saw it as an opportunity to clean the sea a chance to get rid of the trash and do something good while they had time on their hands. More than 350 professional divers were eager to volunteer. Divers in Dahab removed plastic film and other debris that could suffocate the coral. In Hurghada, decades' worth of garbage were removed from a marina and taken to local waste disposal companies for sorting. Many resorts in Egypt reopened in mid-July. But from now on, some of the diving will be devoted to keeping the coral reefs clean. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Is tourism a curse or a blessing? This is a question that comes up in many tourist hotspots. In Kenya, opinion is divided among the Maasai population. There are about 3 million Maasai in total, and many of them live from tourism as rangers, guards, or tour guides. Yes, Anita. When the coronavirus put an end to tourism, it also put an end to this source of income. Members of the Nashulai Maasai Conservancy in Kenya are thinking of new ways to weather the storm together. They will do whatever it takes so that they preserve their environment and way of life. These women are sifting through the river of the Nashulai Conservancy. Located right next to Kenya's famous Masai Mara National Park, this tributary flows into the Mara River. Nelson Ole Reya initiated the cleanup. He pays the women from the nearby villages $5 a day for their work. This is the most important watershed in this part of the Mara. The local community relies on this water for their uh, usage, for cooking, cleaning, and even also the livestock and uh, wildlife. Unfortunately, the river is heavily polluted because of the activities of um, the urban areas, upstream, uh, the tourist camps. All the way to that pool. Oliria and his wife were both born in this area. They co-founded Nashulai, a conservancy run by the local Maasai community. Unlike in other nature reserves, wildlife, people and livestock coexist here. Nashulai itself is um, a very important corridor allowing wildlife to migrate, especially um, elephants, which normally access this area for bathing and also uh, the grey migration passes through this corridor all the way to the other conservancies. This area has always belonged to the local community. But with growing communities and fast land, the wildlife was vanishing. To create the conservancy four years ago, the community members pulled down their fences. And two years later, the wildlife returned. The biggest problem facing wildlife today in Kenya is not actually poaching, as people might actually think of it. It is the lack of space. And that space is with communities. So communities have to be at the center of conservation. The members of the conservancy largely rely on funding from donors, and only a fifth of its income is generated by tourism. But this year, the corona pandemic has devastated the region's economy. Without the tourists that visit the Mara each year, many only rely on their livestock as they lost their jobs as rangers in hotels or traders on the local markets. 
Everything has become difficult. Getting food is a problem. There are diseases all around us. We are just locked down at home and can't leave the village. Through crowdfunding, the Nashulai team has been able to provide food aid to the villages. It's a lifeline for now. It will take a long time before tourists will start coming back. By their visits, they help to protect Kenyan's wildlife. But conservationists like Ole Ria worry that this may no longer work. So we need uh, a paradigm shift in the conservation movement to find out other alternatives to sustain the important work that is done in conservation. It's work in progress, but Ole Ria hopes that involving the local people in this process will build more resilient communities and help nature too. How much trash washes up in Kenya's Mara River? And which areas of the ocean have the biggest plastic waste problems? You may be wondering, and we are wondering as well. Well, all this can be seen not only from the ground level, but also from way above on high-resolution satellite images. There are several web platforms and apps that make this complex data available with a simple click or swipe. Knowing where action is most needed also helps us to fight against pollution. Get your gadgets out and have a go. Fighting pollution in city parks. That was the aim of the online call which hundreds of people in Berlin followed. The cleanup call was based on data collected by volunteers who had discovered many polluted places in the German capital. Plan A supported the call. The startup's focus is environmental protection. Climate change is not one problem. Climate change is a lot of problems that are intertwined, and our data approach helps us actually untangle this complexity. We use the data to pinpoint exactly the locations and the types of issues that happen around the world that need to be immediately acted on. The Berlin-based startup analyzes data from research institutions around the world. Based on its findings, Plan A contacts individuals, companies and community groups in the affected areas worldwide. They publicize their projects and allow users to help fund them. Data analysis can help to identify and address environmental problems more quickly. Litterbase is an online database that's open to everyone. Graphics show the results of more than a thousand scientific studies on marine pollution. On a world map, it's easy to see where research expeditions have already taken place. The latest results from the worldwide scientific community are regularly fed into the database. The aim is to make the global issue of marine pollution more accessible and easily understood, including to non-scientists. Nowadays, nobody reads anything anymore, especially because of social media, and people like to have pictures. Having these maps and these analysis graphs are really providing useful information in really short time to the public. Another example, the Global Forest Change database at the University of Maryland uses a map to show the state of the world's forests. Since 2013, users have been able to call up info based on satellite images. They can see the effects of forest fires, illegal logging and reforestation over long periods. The platform is also dedicated to protecting forests and their inhabitants. It combines satellite technology with open data and crowdsourcing. Data platforms make the problems more visible. And with an app, everyone can do their bit to help tackle them. The CO2 tracking app Reforestum focuses on individual consumption, and it gives you the chance to create and manage your own forest. The Oro Echo app is similar. Enter your daily habits with a few clicks and the app will calculate your carbon footprint and show you how to shrink it. It also invites you to be a climate hero by supporting carbon offset projects that help people and the planet. 
For the digital activists in Berlin, mobilizing people is an important factor in tackling the global problem. The climate protection has made people scared, tired and um, unclear on what they need to do, I think because of the language that is being used. We speak uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily explain to people what the issues are. We should be focusing more on actionable advices rather than simply speaking with big words about the issues. With the help of these apps and data platforms, we can all contribute to the protection of the environment. High tech, but with a low carbon footprint. That is amazing, isn't it? Speaking of low carbon footprint, our next report is about Fafape Ama Estafau, who grows mushrooms in Ghana, but in a very unusual and resource saving way. Nyuta, you know all about how it works, right? I believe I do, Sandra. You basically need sawdust, rice husk, lime, and fungus spores, and a lot of patience. But the devil is in the details. If you want to grow delicious mushrooms this way, then your work needs to be very precise and sterile. This woman knows her fungus, especially oyster mushrooms. Businesswoman Fafape Amaful manages one of Ghana's biggest commercial mushroom farms. She started five years ago with just 10 bags. Today, her company generates 150,000 spawn bags in each production cycle. We supply a lot of hotels, Chinese restaurants, other uh, techy and Australian cuisine restaurants, and also some of the households now consume a lot of the mushrooms. Not much is needed to grow oyster mushrooms. Spawn and in this case, sawdust. There's plenty of that in Accra. Tons of the wood waste are produced every day, but few areas in Ghana have municipal waste collection and sawdust takes a long time to compost. So most of it gets thrown onto trash heaps and burned together with other garbage. Hardly anyone wants it apart from this mushroom grower. The mushrooms are very few. Maybe we'll be here after three months, then they'll come for it. But for the burning aspects, they usually do come for it to go and burn it. And that adds to Accra's air pollution. The exhausts from automobile traffic and trash burning is an unhealthy mix. Reducing the amount of air pollution was something Fafape Amafo took into consideration when she set up her mushroom growing operation. There are many options to use as a substrate for the production of oyster mushrooms. And I chose so that because of its environmental hazards. Every couple of months, a large delivery of sawdust arrives at the farm. One of the challenges we face as a mushroom producing company is the transportation of the raw materials from the sawmills to the farm site. Meanwhile, the sawdust in itself is absolutely free. Preparing the substrate is simple, yet labor intensive. The sawdust is first mixed with rice bran and quick lime. This mixture is then pressed into thousands of small bags. This will be the growth medium for the fungi. In barrels, the bags are heated to 100 degrees Celsius to kill off microorganisms. Only then is a substrate inoculated with a mushroom spawn. It takes at least six weeks for the first fruit bodies to pop up. I have over 100 workers now, both men and women. For the harvesting, I have like two groups, some come in the morning and some for the evening. Demand has grown during the coronavirus pandemic. Eating mushrooms is considered to be good for the immune system. And because of their relatively high protein content, more and more people see them as a healthy substitute for meat. The oyster mushrooms cost a lot less than beef, which is another reason they are gaining in popularity. Most of our kebab are made with beef or chicken. This is amazing. I love it. If more people produced and consumed regionally grown produce like Fafapefo's oyster mushrooms, 
it could have a sustainable effect on Ghana's environment. Mmm, they look great. I need to try those. Maybe we'll soon have sawdust mushrooms here in Lagos too. We hope you enjoyed the show and that you've taken away some ideas and inspiration. That's all for this time. Goodbye and see you soon. I'm Neo Taegui and I'm already looking forward to next week. I couldn't agree more. It is a goodbye from me to here in Kampala, Uganda. Do not forget to check out our social media platforms and our Eco Africa website. We would love to get a virtual visit from you. My name is Sandra Trinobrio and I'll be looking forward to having your company once again next week. Uh -oh.